Okay, so we got another interesting question to deal with, so let's go ahead and dive in. The statement reads, an alternating current I equal I naught cosine omega T flows down a long straight wire and returns along a coaxial conducting tube of radius A. Again, let's emphasize that this is a conducting tube. Okay, part A. In what direction does the induced field point is it radial, circumferential, or longitudinal? Like, what is it? Part B, assuming that the field goes to zero as S goes to infinity, find E of S of T. All right. So, what do we know? Again, we know the flux and Faraday's law. Same thing, different day. All right. Let's look at our diagram, though. So, we have uh, a long line, I, the current going down it in that direction we'll call the z direction we have a conducting tube of radius a and then we draw a quote amperian loop okay our loop will go ahead and be a square and we see that we have length l at a distance s from the axis and if we look at this uh, for part a we see that the magnetic field in a quasi-static approximation is circumferential i.e use the right hand rule on the current and we see the magnetic field is trying to curl around the, the axis, so it comes as a circumferential field. All right, this is analog to the current in a solenoid because the current is running circumferentially, and hence the field is longitudinal. So we see that since the current, um, since in the solenoid the current is running circumferentially, we know the field is longitudinal. We're approximating, we're showing that since the uh, Magnetic field is circumferential that the uh, current has, to, or the field, the electric field, or the current has to be longitudinal. So we're just comparing and contrasting what we know. Pretty easy there, I think. Uh, but for part B, we need to now use this Amperian loop. And uh, using the uh, what we were told in the question, we see that B goes to zero outside, right? So outside, we'll just go ahead and say that B is zero. So hence here, the induced field is zero. Okay, much like the field outside of a solenoid again. Again, thank you for being a conducting tube. Kind of weird setup here. Doesn't actually mimic the true reality, but there's a whole paper on it that the author mentions. Um, let's see. It's I'll post it up in the description, but we have JD. I can't even pronounce the last name, but I'll post it up. It's a cool little paper. All right, but anyway, so for inside the tube... We use Faraday's law, and except here we have to apply the line integral. So that line integral for the E is going to, since we know that it's running longitudinal, we don't have to worry about the vertical shanks. Um, <clears throat> so we're just going from 0 to L, just the length of L, pretty straightforward there. E will, with the dot product with DL, will just go to the magnitude E. This is what these approximations are good for. However, the flux, we now need to define as the integral, which is B dot DA. So if we're using a quasi-static approximation, the integral of a line, or just a line current, is mu i over 2 pi s bar. Okay, to some different s. We're running out of letters here. Um, and of course, we're going from uh, zero to, from s to a in the Amperian loop. That's our vertical segment. And then we're going from zero to l, which is our horizontal segment. So we're getting the full cross-sectional area there. Okay, so our... Uh, we go from dx to ds, okay? Pretty straightforward integral there, I think. Of course, we see that the uh, 1 over s bar, ds bar, gives us a natural log. Natural log a minus s gives us, using the rules of logs, a over s. And then l minus 0 just gives us l. And you see in our simplification that the l's cancel in red. It was hard to see the cancel symbol because l's are pretty vertical. But also, we see that the only thing that's time-dependent here is the current. Okay, so we attribute the d by dt to the current. Um, in our next step, we see that now we actually have to plug in what the current is as a function of time, and then we apply the derivative. Again, this cosine goes to negative sine. Use the chain rule to get the omega, the factor of omega, and you see that the negatives cancel. And then we just compact it nicely. Okay, so with that... When we put the directionality back in it, like we discussed in part A, we see that that's a longitudinal field, so it's pointing in the z-hat direction. Pretty quick, but be careful of these definitions of where to apply them.